welcome. Thank you very much for coming to the Advisory Committee on Transparency event on Spending Transparency, uh, the Data Act, and, be and beyond. Uh, we're happy to be hosting this event and bringing you this panel of distinguished experts who will be able to provide insight on it from a variety of perspectives. Uh, I'm Ginger McCall. I'm the Federal Policy Manager at the Sunlight Foundation. Uh, and we, along with the Advisory Committee on Transparency, run these events. Uh, the Advisory Committee on Transparency is a nonpartisan uh, committee that educates policymakers on transparency related issues, bringing together experts from a wide variety of backgrounds to explore important public policy topics. The committee is organized as a project of the Sunlight Foundation, a transparency focused DC nonprofit organization, and it includes representatives of organizations from across the political spectrum. Today's panel will include experts from the advocacy community as well as academia and government. Our moderator, Caitlin Devine, is senior developer at the Sunlight Foundation. She currently leads Sunlight's procurement and spending research project. Her other projects include the Sunlight API portal, Clear Spending, PolitiWoops, and Journalism US. She also evangelizes technology within Sunlight by teaching Python classes. Caitlin is on the advisory board for Open Corporates and holds a BS in applied math from Johns Hopkins University. Thank you again for being here, and I hope that you enjoy the panel. Thank you. Ah, there we go. Thanks, Ginger. Um, like Ginger said, I'm the moderator uh, for today's topic, which is Spending Transparency, the Data Act, and Beyond. Um, we at the Sunlight Foundation generally extol the virtues of transparency in government in a lot of different areas, uh, but spending transparency is particularly close to my heart. As citizens, the clearest window we have into government's real priorities uh, is ultimately what the government spends money on. Senator Coburn and then Senator Obama realized this in 2006 when they sponsored the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act, uh, which created USAspending.gov. Although well-intentioned, the actual implementation of this law has proven to be somewhat problematic. It was designed to essentially be a website on top of two existing data systems that track grants and contracts valued over $25,000. However, this leaves out a huge percentage of federal spending, including many operational costs of the government, like salaries and pensions, and even Medicare and Medicaid payments um, who have failed to report to the system, which constitutes nearly 20% of the federal budget. Uh, the data that is reported is plagued with data quality issues. So today we're going to talk about some of the current efforts to reform the state of federal spending transparency, uh, what lessons can be learned from previous efforts, and how we can make it better going forward. I am extremely pleased to be joined by three experts on the topic. First is Hudson Hollister, the founder and executive director of the Data Transparency Coalition. Prior to founding the Data Transparency Coalition, he served as counsel to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform of the U.S. House of Representatives, whose room we're in and as an attorney fellow in the Office of Interactive Disclosure at the Securities and Exchange Commission. Before his government service, he was a securities litigator in the Chicago office of Latham & Watkins LLP. Next is Nancy DiPaolo, who is the Chief of Congressional and Intergovernmental Affairs at the Recovery, Accountability, and Transparency Board, where she has served since its inception. Since the, February, since the board's February 2009 creation, she has been responsible for media, congressional, and intergovernmental relations, now concentrating solely on the latter two. She is responsible for working with members of Congress and their staff on all matters related to the board's mandates and serves as liaison to the 55 states and territories, coordinating and fostering key federal state activities. Before this position, Mr. Powell served as the former chairman, Earl Devaney's Deputy Associate Inspector General for External Affairs at the Department of Interior, and is pleased to continue serving under the new chair, Kathleen Tai. Finally, we're joined by Navin B. Carey, an attorney with international experience in anti-corruption, combating money laundering, asset recovery compliance, and more. He currently serves as the chair of the Financial Stability Board Working Group on Relationships of the Legal Entity Identifier, and is conducting doctoral research at the George Washington University Law School. His previous positions include stints at the International Monetary Fund, as a consultant to the U.S. Department of State, as executive director of the Independent Commission Against Corruption in Mauritius, and more. In addition to his studies at George Washington University Law School, Naveen has degrees from Middlesex University and the London School of Economics. He also served as a visiting scholar at Harvard Law School. So thank you all very much to our panelists for joining us. And we'll hear from each of our speakers briefly, starting with Hudson. Thanks, Caitlin. Hello to all of you. I see a lot of familiar faces in the room. What I'll do is describe who I am and why I'm here and give a, a bit of brief background on this issue. I apologize to all of you who have heard the same bullet points for three years running. 
I'm Hudson Hollister. I founded the Data Transparency Coalition. We are the only tech industry association that cares about what the government does with its own data. We try to persuade the government to standardize and to publish all of the information it collects and generates. And I fully agree with Caitlin. Spending information is what's for dinner. There's nothing more important or, or fundamental to the operations and values of government than information about its spending. And as Caitlin's own research demonstrates, the government is not making that information accessible to citizens and not putting it in a format that makes it useful. Let's go over the challenges that we face today in the way that the federal government tries to convey some of its spending information to citizens. You can go to usaspending.gov, but if you do even a cursory review, you'll see that it's not accurate, it's not complete, and it's not searchable. First, it's not accurate. As Caitlin's research at clearspending.com, clearspending.com plug, as Caitlin's research indicates, usaspending.gov is only accurate for one-third of federal programs. Now that's for the grants side of usaspending.gov. Caitlin's team could not evaluate the contract side of usaspending.gov at all because there's nothing to compare it to. usaspending.gov is not complete. You can go on there and find a summary of each grant and each contract, ostensibly. But that summary only includes obligations. It doesn't include disbursements. That is, the summaries on usaspending.gov only show when an agency decides to spend funds, but does, do not show when those funds are actually spent. Not only that, but usaspending.gov only includes grants and contracts, completely ignoring the two-thirds or so, maybe two-thirds, of internal spending. Is that about right? What proportion of the government's total spending is on grants and contracts? It's about one-third, give or take. Anyway, two-thirds of spending is totally ignored by usaspending.gov. And third, usaspending.gov is not searchable. There's no way to reliably connect things to things. You can't pull up a particular program and see all of the grants or contracts it put out. You can't pull up a grantee or contractor and reliably, uh, having confidence in entity identification, see all the grants or the contracts it has received. So what's, what's the answer to this mess? Surely it's, it's an advance that usaspending.gov was established at all, but how do we get from here to full data transparency for spending? How do we define full data transparency for spending? Well, the Data Act, I, I hope, provides some of the answer to that, and I'm excited to see its progress having passed the House 388 to 1 last month because I worked on the very first version of the Data Act when I was a congressional staffer in early 2011. If you read the Data Act, uh, you'll see that it amends the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act, and for that reason, it's very hard to read. So I like to distill that entire complicated document down to three verbs. Standardize, publish, analyze. First, standardize. The Data Act directs the Department of the Treasury to create government-wide data standards for all spending information. Now, one of the reasons why usaspending.gov has all those shortcomings is that spending information is divided among several different entities in today's government. There are about eight different reporting streams, eight different reporting regimes that are important. Agencies must report, um, I'll, I'll take them off if you want, I can, I can list them on my fingers. Agencies report their, you don't have to write them down though, I can tell you afterwards. Agencies can report, they need to report their, uh, their accounting balances to Treasury. They request payments from Treasury. They report their budget actions to OMB. They summarize their grants to Commerce. They summarize their contracts to the GSA. Meanwhile, grantees and contractors have obligations as well. Uh, grantees have to report to whatever agency gave them the money. Contractors also have to report to what agency gave them the funds. And finally, if you are a prime grantee or prime contractor, you've got to summarize all your subgrants or subcontractors to the FSRS at, at OMB. What, how many is this? this is, I, it's a very unorthodox counting mechanism, but this is eight. <laughs> eight different reporting requirements, all maintained by different people. Usually the person inside an agency who's responsible for one of those doesn't even know the person who's responsible for the others. Anyway, that first verb, standardize. Treasury is directed by the Data Act to create consistent government-wide data formats for all of that stuff, to connect it all using consistent data standards. For instance, a common identifier for the recipients of all these federal funds. And that's why I'm excited that Navin's here because 
One thing that Treasury should do if it gets this mandate is look at using the legal entity identifier, which is already gaining ground in financial regulation over here in the spending world. And I'm happy that the Treasury Department's beginning to consider that. A second verb, and the others won't take nearly as long, I apologize. The second verb, publish. The Data Act directs the Treasury Department after it has finished creating all these consistent data standards for those eight different reporting requirements to publish the whole corpus online, make it available to citizens, and also to inspectors general, to congressional appropriators, to the watchdog groups like the Sunlight Foundation, the people who need it. And finally, analyze. The House version of the Data Act continues and perpetuates one of the most important oversight programs in our government. When Congress passed the stimulus law in 2009, it directed the brand new Recovery, Accountability, and Transparency Board, uh, where Nancy has been from the start, to create an accountability platform, a data platform that delivered stimulus spending data to inspectors general so that they can analyze it to find waste and fraud. That program is still around. It has saved $100 million through the work of inspectors general who can use that data, combine it with things, and the Data Act directs the recovery board, at least the House version, to extend that accountability platform to cover all federal spending so that all of it can be laid open to inspectors general and can be combined with other sources. We're hopeful that the Senate will follow the House's lead by passing the Data Act, uh, that the Senate will bring its version back into conformity with the House version, and that we'll see this action very soon. Meanwhile, we're very excited to see more and growing support inside the administration for making federal spending data more transparent. The fiscal service, in fact, at the Treasury Department, intends to pursue data transparency whether they get a mandate to in the Data Act or not. But if the Data Act doesn't pass, they're not going to have authority over all eight of those reporting streams, just two of them. That's why the Data Act is really essential. I'm looking forward to digging into more of these details from the perspective of the tech industry as we continue, and thanks so much for having me. Thank you very much, Hudson. And next, we'll hear from Nancy DiPaolo. All right. Well, thanks. Well, you've heard where I come from. And just as a reminder, the Recovery Board was formed from the ARA, the stimulus, the, the bill itself. And it was something very smart that Congress did. It wasn't a new idea, but they actually said, we're putting out this money. It's got to go out fast. It's a lot of money over a short period. We are going to create a, a mandate an independent entity, and they're going to have to prevent as well as watch for and stop fraud, waste, and abuse. And the prevent, to be put into words, was a new thing. IGs and most oversight have to do a play and chase, which is the way things are set up. They said, we need you guys to get in front of this money. They also told us that we had to create transparency of the, all the $840 billion. And by the way, we had four months to do it because reporting was going to start in October. So we were faced with the challenge of how to do this. And the first thing would have been to try to make a reporting system that would pre-populate and utilize a lot of information out there. Because there were 28 agencies who gave out money under the Recovery Act. So not, no one system was going to work. <clears throat> And we realized, unfortunately, there was no federal system that had accurate enough data, that pre-populating was not going to work. So we simultaneously built an intake system, which became federalreporting.gov, and a public transparency site that would take that information and put it out there, and that's recovery.gov. And they've proved to be pretty successful. Um, I think some of the reasons are, first of all, we made mistakes at the beginning. We had errors just like anyone else. But the difference was, I guess, because we were inspectors general and we said, whoever puts that data in is responsible for it. We weren't afraid of stopping bad data from going in. So we baked in hard checks. You cannot tell me you live in a zip code in Alaska if you just told me you're in Iowa. We're not going to let you do that. I mean, really basic things, guys. A DUNS number is nine digits, and we, the Fed, because that's all we had to go from, you've got CCR and SAM, right? The law says to get federal money, you have to be registered. We're going to make sure you, what you're telling us, 
matches what you're telling the other part of the government that's going to pay you. So we baked in things like that that kind of made for circular, circular logic. I know I do something like that to myself. Nuclear. 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 Um, but, you know, we, we built a system, and we also were able, we had the advantage because we were new, that we could use new technology. We were not, there didn't, there wasn't a need for tons of code. There wasn't a need to hardwire it into something else. So that's an advantage, and I think that's a lesson. I feel that the federal government, we are in a new era of fiscal shrinkage. If we think sequestration was bad, it's not over. It's going to continue. I work with the states. Back in... 08, 09, and 10, most of the states were either broke or practically broke, essentially. They've been through this. We as a federal government are just now starting to, to feel it. And I think we've got to think, you know, agencies are out there for a purpose. And with shrinking dollars, should you be spending money supporting aged legacy systems? Or should you say, you know what, there's new technology out there. And the reason I bring this up is to reference what you talked about, Hudson. We were shocked as we built a reporting system that there's tons of reporting going on. People get money. And grants programs, depending on the program within an agency, might report quarterly, they might report annually, they might report only at the end. Contracts report totally separately. So recipients, especially think of a state or municipality, who's taking in money from tons of programs. They can't create their own system <laughs> to feed us data. They're having to spend lots of money and effort. And then what happens when it gets to our agencies? They can't tell any of us how it's being spent because it's in all these pockets. And the definition of an address isn't even consistent. Or because there's a, an acceptance of data, too much data that's not real, it, it doesn't match up. And so agencies, federal agencies, are also wasting money at the end of each year in huge reconciliations. And that money, that's a lot of money. And it's not an easy dollar amount to find because it comes out of a lot of pots. So I think financially, for the government to actually function and, and feed the poor or build a new infrastructure, do things with shrinking money, we better stop wasting money on, on technology that's aged. So it was just, it was kind of sad to see with recovery that was going on. So while recovery reporting was burdensome because we had to say on top of what you're doing, you're going to need to report to us every quarter, it had ended up being pretty easy. And what we're suggesting and what we like seeing in the Data Act is that we believe reporting can be consolidated that entities do not have to be reporting all over the place. Um, and the Recovery Board did a GRIP project last year, which was the Grants Reporting Information Project. And um, we only used nine different recipients, but they included a state, some large municipalities, some universities, and um, three or four federal agency programs. And we tested having these nine report in through a single portal with a very limited amount of data points. And the small test we did worked, but it was way too small to prove a reduction of burden. I mean, we really, you know, you have to be realistic. So what we'd liked in the House Data Act is that since we already have an infrastructure with federal reporting and we're used to collecting data from other agencies, that um, it would have a further test of this. And I think that's important. Again, it'll save the federal government a lot of money and it'll put data out there because if people are reporting through a single portal and it's being housed in a single database, when Congress needs to do a data call, instead of agency heads having to rush for it, it's going to be there when good government groups or, or grants groups are trying to figure it out. Um, one of the biggest users we found of recovery.gov are the states. There are these things called the single audits. So most people receiving a substantial amount of federal grants have to perform single audits. And um, if there's, it's great if 
these state auditors and the other people responsible can be using the same data that the feds are looking at if you're all actually able to see it. So there's just a lot of um, in-depth work that can be done and then you can actually start seeing what's going on. It's a good way to see duplicity in government. I mean, we all know that things are, are going on in different places, but um, let's try to see where that is. And then for the oversight world, it's very important because the same people who are defrauding one program are usually defrauding another. I mean, that's how, you know, these guys go out there and they find a way to rip off the government. They don't do it one place. They're doing it in multiple places. And it's hard as oversight entities for us to look and see, try to find those, those weaknesses even, or where systems are vulnerable to that, or to waste, where, where is waste happening? So we really like that idea, and it just came to light so much with recovery, with dealing with so many agencies. Um, GAO has been talking about this for years, and it was great to hear Gene Dodaro twice under oath say that something like the Data Act needs to happen. Um, I think there are a lot of good people in government and there's a lot of desire, but it's hard. These are hard decisions to make. And I, we at the board have come to believe it will take a law to set some mandates and to set some deadlines for people to be able to, A, not be so afraid, because there are good people out there who are just afraid. It's a, it's a big thing to tackle. And um, people, you know, I think also with a law, you can have some straight mandates such as the Data Act puts forward. Um, so I could go on about a lot of it. Um, we're now working a lot on the San Hurricane Sandy supplement. Gave the recovery board a couple more years because they found we were able to really, because we shone a light on the spending, and we're able, we have something called the Recovery Operations Center, or ROC. And it's actually very cool. And we use a lot of modern technology to look across all the spending. And where we might not be able to stop the fraud before the award is made, we usually are able to just shift the paradigm closer to when the people are starting to think about that fraud, to look at who really got that money instead of waiting till all the money's gone out the door. And it, it's worked. We've assisted the IGs, to, as, as Hudson said, and found a lot of that fraud. So they wanted us to work on that for Hurricane Sandy, and we are. But Sandy doesn't have the reporting requirements. Sandy doesn't have the transparency requirements. There's no single entity within the federal government who was given charge of collecting Sandy spending. And I, I used this example the other day, but it's a true story. A governor's office called me, and it wasn't New York and New Jersey. It was a smaller state. And they said, my governor needs to know how much money has come in, and God forbid you could tell me how much you think is coming in. I can't find out how much money has come into my state. And I work at 1717 Pennsylvania. And I made calls Caddy Corner. I just started making phone calls. Nobody could tell me how what, much. What was. offices are Caddy Corner to 1717 Pennsylvania Avenue? I don't know. There are a few buildings, a few pretty buildings. But seriously, guys, no one could tell me how much money was going into a state. I see that as a problem. <laughs> I mean, that's, I'm not even talking about asking for a transactional level. So I, I think, um, I hate to be so forceful and say it's got to happen soon and it's time to come into this century, but I just, I think every reason is there for it too. And I think a lot of groups have gotten together and um, hopefully we're moving forward. So I'll stop now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I mean, you make a really good point that a lot of federal spending is really executed at the state level. So um, one of the mandates of USA Spending was to track subrecipient reporting, which really didn't get carried out. I and mean, certainly got halfway carried out, I think, very late in the game, definitely past its statutory deadline. Um, but you really just don't have a good sense of it if a huge percentage of, the, of this is going through a governor's office. Um, but thank you very much. And next we'll hear uh, from Naveen about the legal entity identifier. Thank you, Caitlin. <coughs> thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm going to be talking very briefly on the LEI. I'm not sure how much you know about it, but there's a lot going on about the LEI. 
what it stands for is the legal entity identifier and which is a unique identification number uh, that uh, entities will have to register for by entities I mean entities involved in financial transaction so the LEI is basically a code a 20 number code without any persistent intelligence that is going to be uh, out there for entities, financial entities, to register and obtain. The point is to try and ensure that over a period of time this develops into a system where each financial entity, entity in the world has an LEI. Now, the origin of the LEI is basically down to the financial crisis because the policymakers, financial entities, regulators came to realize that there was a problem about financial data. There was not, I mean, nobody could really track down financial data that could help assess uh, counterparties' risk and exposures across the world. I think the case that really gave rise to this was the Lehman Brothers case. So this inability, although, I mean, I think the problem is that even though there was data out there, there wasn't any system in place and nobody could track that data in a very organized and structured manner that could enable regulators or policymakers or those who are having to deal with the problem to track down risk and exposures of financial entities and counterparties. So that was basically, in very few words, the origin. And it was believed at that point in time that there was need for such a system to be developed and put in place that could track down you know, uh, information about entities involved in financial transactions across the world. So the LEI is basically a global system. It's going to be a global system. And it emanates from a decision of the G20 in June 2011, I think. And the mandate was given to the Financial Stability Board to kind of put the system in place and try and develop uh, an a governance structure as well as you know the operational dimension of how to go about to try and get uh, financial entities to provide financial data uh, to a particular institution or entity uh, in a country or in a region uh, that would eventually enable different end users make use of the financial data that is available there. So. The legal, the LEI is basically a code, but the issue is really what kind of reference data will that code be populated with? And there are two types of data known as reference data that is going to be eventually, uh, the LEI is going to be populated with. The first set of data is what is known as the core data which is based on a set of attributes that really has its source from the ISO, the International Standards Organization 17442, which lists down a set of nine attributes, data attributes. This is what is known as the core data attribute of the LEI. They are basic information about the name of the entity, the registered address, the headquarters address, when did it have, when did it first obtain an LEI? You know, there are nine of them. So this is, at the launch of the LEI, this is going to be the kind of data that will be available in the global LEI system. Now, over and above the core data, I think the point is whether on the basis of the core data, the name, the address, headquarters address and so on, is that enough to facilitate end users achieve their objectives? For example, would that be in adequate information to enable regulators to carry out systemic risk 
assessment? The answer is no. So that's where the second type of reference data comes into play. It's known as relationship data. And this is where I come in because over the last year and a half, I've been coordinating the Financial Stability Board Working Group on how to define and identify and capture relationship data. First of all, what is relationship data? So at the moment, the decisions that have been taken by the ROC, which is the Regulatory Oversight Committee of the Global LEI, is that the first phase relationship data is going to be based on accounting standards, consolidation rules. For example, which entity has to consolidate which entity? And what are the rules that govern that uh, consolidation? Because not all entities consolidate their, for example, subsidiaries. Or put it differently, not all subsidiaries are consolidated. There are very specific technical rules in consolidation standard that define, you know, a relationship between the parent and the child, or the parent and the children, or the children who become parent and their grandchildren. So this is kind of the relationship data itself. And I'm still working on this. And we have regular twice weekly calls on Friday with a lot of participants in the LEI, which is known as the Private Sector Preparatory Group. So the discussion is about the different aspect of relationship data and what is it that we will require in order to be able to meet the objectives. Now, as far as the benefits are concerned, I think each party will find itself within the LEI. The market participants have agreed and they're pushing for the LEI because they will benefit from the LEI because at the moment financial entities pay a lot of money to data vendors to get relationship information. For example, Dunn or Bloomberg sells data about entities to the tune of $200,000 for an entity. It's $2,500 if you're an individual per month. So data vendors provide this as a service and even government pay for this service. So the market participants are going to benefit in the sense that the LEI data is going to be out there and free, I think probably available at a very minimal fee, but open and accessible, right? Once it is in place and operational. So there's a, a big cost element for financial entities involved, and the, I think that's why they see it as a benefit. Regulators for assessing systemic risk, I think the main reason behind, the main motivation really behind the LEI was systemic risk assessment. <coughs> Excuse me. Basically to try and avoid a future financial crisis, right? By trying to be able to really, in time, track down risk and exposures. Enforcement agencies who are involved in fighting corruption and money laundering will benefit in the sense that they might be able or will be able to track information about beneficial ownership, uh, you know, asset recovery strategies. And organizations that are involved in trying to, you know, push forward transparency issues in political funding is another example where there are some benefits to the extent that we are able to try and get entities that are involved in contribution and expenditure on political campaign prepared and willing to, you know, get involved in the, in the uh, you know, LEI system. So it's a multiple or multi end user kind of, you know, uh, platform that is going to provide benefits to different end users. Now, well, uh, Caitlin, tell me if I'm taking too much time, because there's a lot to talk about in the LEI. So the governance structure, briefly, the sovereign policy kind of organ, organ that's going to supervise uh, the LEI, the global LEI system, the GLEIS, G-L-E-I-S, is the ROC. 
the Regulatory Oversight Committee, which is presently chaired by Matthew Reed of, Reed of the Treasury, but I think attached to the OFR. And then uh, they are basically going to be setting the standards and they are not going to be involved in the operations you know, of data, modeling, data definition, and so on, and mon monitoring the collection, the capture of data at the ground level. This is going to be done by the COU, the Central Operating Unit, which is going to set standard for the local operating unit that's going to operate at the ground level. And those are the people, or the entity, that are going to be collecting and, and data and dishing out LEI to entities. So it's kind of three-tier, three-level governance structure, the ROC, the COU, and the LOU. The LOU is really the critical player because the local operating unit is going to be the, the, the platform where all the financial entities are going to be registered and issued with an LEI and provide information about their firm. And so this is the governance structure, and they work together with the private sector and a, a, you know, an umbrella organization called the PSPG, the Private Sector Preparatory Group, uh, which operates on three working groups, of which the relationship working group is one, and which I chair. Now, in the US, well, something very important about the LEI, it's already operational to a certain degree, because the ROC decided that should not wait for the whole system to be put in place, but that a transition system be an, you know, developed, uh, an interim system be put in place so that entities can already start you know, getting LEI, applying for LEI and providing information. And this is already in place. And there are six. This takes place under the auspices of what is known as the pre-LOU. The pre-LOU is going to become the LOU eventually, once the transition system is over and done. Now, there are six pre-LOU fully functional at the moment. The CFTC CICI utility. Uh, I think it's CFTC compliant identifier, interim identifier system, which is run by the CFTC, is, is a pre-LOU. And they already... I must go back a little bit. The CICI was already in place before the LEI. I think it came in place about two years ago, and it's been one of the inspiring you know, experience for the LEI to move forward. So it's already operational, and the point is that as and when the LEI materializes and becomes more, you know, takes shape and becomes more operational, these pre-LOUs are going to transition into the global LEI so that the CFTC CICI system or utility is going to become the global LEI, you know, US component or part. And the interesting thing is that there are six of them. There is the London Stock Exchange. There is the IRIS, which was given a pre-LOU status last week. There is a DW Daten of the German, uh, I think, uh, Stock Exchange. There is INSEE in France, which is a re government research institute. And then there is uh, Turkey, Talaskav, or CAT. Uh, which is a pre-LOU, there are six of them. If you go to a, a website called uh, www.lei.rock.org, you will get uh, all the material and all the information about what's going on uh, uh, on the level of the global LEI system. So the, pre, the LEI is already operational, and the next thing I want to conclude on that is, we can, I mean, we can come back again on some of the issues is that two organizations have already started compiling the data that are already existent within those six pre-LOUs. One is Open Corporates, run by Chris Taggart. He came up last week with a site by compiling existing data from the pre-LOU, pre-LEI. Forgot. The pre is really the interim phase. They are all going to be LOU and LEI by next year probably. So what's happening is open corporates and uh, there's the four organizations that are participants in the PSPG platform 
they have also come up with a web portal trying to compile the information that are, that are already provided by those six pre-LOUs, pre-LEI information. So what they are doing, they have combined those data and they are already opening up to the public. The, the four organization portal is free and open. I think open corporate is paid, uh, but still it's an open source uh, platform. So I think what's happening is that the LEI, the global LEI is being put in place. It's probably going to be launched. I think we are at a stage where the foundation and the board of directors or the COU is going to be in place by next year. So, and then it's going to be launched. But at the same time, it's already started operation through the six pre-LOUs. And uh, basically, I think this is, I mean, what's been going on very, very briefly about the LEI. It's, it's a huge project and it's taking time to unfold. But at the same time, the, the responsible for it, I think, want to be more cautious and, and you know, than really rushing through. I mean, uh, um, you know, happy to take questions and, and answer your queries. Thank you. Thank you, Naveen. Um, well, yeah, we'll have, um, we're going to have some in-panel discussion, and then we're going to have some questions at the end from the audience. Can I give a bit of context sure. about the LEI? Just to, I, I'm excited that we're going to, we're considering the topics together. Um, as you all have heard from uh, this brief overview, the LEI is a common identifier for the companies and the financial firms that have to submit information to financial regulators. Unfortunately, today, there is no proposal to use the LEI to track government spending. But that aspiration is one of the reasons I think why today's panel is combined. I'm excited that Naveen's on this panel because, frankly, in government spending, we need a common identifier for all the recipients. We don't have one. There's no, no, no way to identify the entities that receive grants and contracts and track them with other information. No way to take a contractor and see all the payments it has received. The LEI might be one way to do that. Unfortunately, like I said, there's no proposal. Uh, in, in fact, when our coalition broached that topic with the fiscal service at the Treasury and with OMB and said, why don't you consider using this identifier that's already being constructed in the financial regulatory world for federal spending? Not only had they never heard of the LEI, they had never heard of the Office of Financial Research, the office at the Treasury down the hall that is in charge of setting up the LEI. Sure thing. That, that, um, so I'm, I'm happy to give that context and excited that in this panel and other venues, uh, we're, we're seeing data standards and financial regulation considered together with data standards and federal spending. I'm not answering the question. I'll come back to the question, which is, I think, a very interesting question, but at the same time, a long shot. And, but I think it's critical that we come back to the question because it's, it's, it's very important from a transparency perspective. But I, I forgot to mention something about the US uh, and the LEI. Apart from the CFTC, I think the OFR is in the leading position about the LEI, and they are working, they're doing quite a lot of work on on the LEI. So I think if you look at it this way, on the regulatory side, we have the OFR, uh, which is working on the LEI. But on the operational aspect, we have the CFTC. So that's a good indication of how the LEI is moving forward within the US. Thank you. Thanks. And even just for a little bit more context on what the system looks like right now, at least in terms of federal spending, is right now the US government uses DUNS numbers, which is a proprietary system run by Dun & Bradstreet, which is a business, a for-profit business right. analytics firm. So not only does US government pay millions, tens of millions of dollars each year to license this data, but we also require contractors and grant recipients to report to it. So we're also facilitating their business model of getting more business analytics information, um, and but paying them to let us do that. Uh, and it's all self-reported. So if you really do want to look at the corporate hierarchies of a contractor that we're giving money to, it's very difficult, very spotty. Um, the GAO has an excellent report on how bad Dunn's numbers are and how endemic they are to our reporting in the U.S. government. So it is a tough problem, no doubt. Um, and I think that's why um, people have been unwilling to address it until now. But it is so fundamental and at the core of so many things, um, including law enforcement, 
tracking money laundering, contractor oversight. Naveen mentioned political finance. So, you know, a lot of times people will split up their political contributions over several different entities, but you know, they're all owned by the same person. So at least while that's not technically illegal, having better information on that, I, I think, is fundamental to our democracy. Um, and I, I think it's never been easier to create a subsidiary or a legal entity, uh, probably because of the internet. But um, that's another thing that makes it really difficult. Uh, at one of the working group meetings I was at for the Financial Stability Board, which, as Naveen said, is kind of um, spearheading this whole effort, I actually heard somebody from a gigantic investment bank say, you know, we need someone to tell us to register all of our subsidiaries. We don't know how many we have. You know, they just create them to do financial transactions and then dispose of them. So they use it as a way to um, manage uh, legal responsibility, uh, but it also makes it so that you have no idea what assets your um, ultimate parent company owns. And that we saw is a huge problem and is part of the reason for the, the financial collapse. So uh, with that, I'm gonna move on to some questions for the panel. Um, we keep saying Data Act, uh, which is the Digital Accountability and Transparency Act. I don't know if we spelled it out before. Um, but, <laughs> uh, so this is the most recent effort to improve um, spending transparency. So how specifically uh, is it gonna improve spending transparency? And since we're in the, is it the third, second or third iteration of it? Um, it? About number five. five? Uh, at least over two Congresses. So, and why, so what is it specifically gonna do and why hasn't it already passed? <laughs> well, I, I, I first go back to those three verbs, standardize, publish, analyze. Those are the three things the Data Act does to those eight different areas of reporting where the federal government reports its spending information. Why hasn't it passed already? Well, I'll give you one answer. Uh, when I wrote the first version, uh, the very first version of the Data Act uh, didn't put Treasury in charge of this. Uh, it put the Recovery Board in charge of this, it, an expanded version of the Recovery Board, which is one of the reasons why Nancy and I are so chummy on this panel together. Uh, and there, there was a, a great deal of opposition uh, at the White House and in the Senate to putting the Recovery Board in charge of standardize, publish, analyze. Another reason, uh, simple drafting preferences. Uh, if you've looked at the law that governs federal spending, you will see that in Title 31, there's a note to the code. That's where uh, the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act of 2006 was added in. There's a note to Title 31. When I first went in to consider how to change the law to require spending transparency, I thought, oh, the note to the code's difficult to find. Citizens won't know where that is. Why don't we build a beautiful new section of Title 31 and have it do all the things we need it to? And so. Idealistic as that was, I uh, in the first draft of the Data Act, I, I struck out all of that note to the code and created a new section of Title 31 that did all the things that the 2006 law did and also all the things that we wanted to do with the Data Act. Unfortunately, that was a bad drafting choice uh, because it would have required Senator Coburn to take down the thing that is framed on his office wall. And we had some opposition in the Senate just as a result of that. Uh, fortunately, the law has now, the proposal has now been rewritten to do extensive, complicated, and somewhat turgid surgery on that note to the code so it no longer repeals FIFADA. Even though all along the intent of the law has been to build on, not to wipe away the advances of that 2006 law. So that's one of the reasons. Want to take a stab at other reasons why it hasn't passed, Nancy? I think it's a complicated issue. It, it shouldn't be. It's the sexiest issue. Yeah, definitely. Data's sexy, right? But um, it, it shouldn't be, because basically what it comes down to is saying things we've been talking about, but talking about how um, we need to know where federal tax money is going so that people can either make their own decisions on why, whether it should be, and how it's being handled. And those people handling it should be able to track it better so that they themselves can do a better job with it. Um, I think there's always a gap. Lawmakers come from a lot of different backgrounds, and that's important. But technology is, is very advanced now. It's so different. I mean, just think of the last 10 or 12 years. It's changed so much. And so sometimes you'll go into a lawmaker's office, and they'll say, oh, yeah, you should be able to attach that to that. I should, but, oh, it's too complicated. 
And what they don't know is that technology now is not that complicated or that expensive. So um, I think it's easy for naysayers to come along and say, oh, we've got these systems and, and we've got to keep them running. And, and if you tell us to tear, the, tear down that wall, you know, it, we don't know what's going to happen. It's too scary. So I think it's, it is a big change. And change is scary especially when you're dealing with some of this. And I think um, the, the, misunder the misunderstanding that the technology exists now, it existed a while ago, it's not that new to accomplish some of these things um, is part of it. I think also um, for a long time, I, I mentioned well-meaning and smart people, and actually, Mr. Issa once said it very well, um, and he referred to different heads of OMB starting back in um, the Reagan years. And he went through both DNR run OMBs and things that were said publicly. And, and we do believe that people meant they wanted to make these changes, and then not one of them accomplished it. And, and so, um, those same, not the same people, but people within those same jobs are going to come up and they say, trust us, trust us, we want to do this, you're right, give us another chance. And so rather than passing a law, I think often it's easier to trust, and, and again, I'm not even inferring that these people don't mean what they're saying, but the reality is they will not be able to accomplish it and they will not be able to. So I think you've got a lot of things like that. Um, going on that that probably have thwarted it and and not a lot of laws are getting passed these days <laughs> uh, this is <laughs> quite frankly so um put one about transparency and data and people you know hopefully the recovery act and recovery.gov recovery.gov was used by so many types of people we got calls from people because people could look at their backyard and see what was going on and they wanted to but also the different oversight and the, the larger groups and, and the government itself was using it. And so all of a sudden you saw maybe it could happen. But until you got to see it on a small pocket of funding, I think it was kind of hard to believe that we could do that. So, so I think you've got some convincing that just takes time maybe as normal. Yeah, that was sort of getting at my next question, is like, why do we need a law specifically? You know, we've seen a lot of different efforts from the administration, mostly from the Office of Management and Budget over the years, including the Government Accountability and Transparency Board. So how are, how are those efforts different than the Data Act and what they set out to accomplish? Because the Government Accountability and Transparency Board is only an advisory body, in a nutshell. In fact, when the Government Accountability and Transparency Board, which as many of you know, the President set up in an executive order in 2011, when the GATT Board made its recommendations in December 2011, uh, the recommendations were things that the Data Act would do, and those recommendations have not been put in, pr in place yet. The recommendations were to create a government-wide accountability platform for spending, sound familiar, uh, to track grants and contracts in one place, and to establish a government-wide identifier for the grant, the grants themselves and the contract vehicles. None of those three things have, done, have been done because today in government, it's no one's day job to do them. And that's why we need legislation, because it's nobody's job. Earlier this afternoon, I ticked off the eight different areas of federal spending reporting Nobody's portfolio is all of those. Some of them go to OMB, some of them go to Treasury, some to Commerce, some to GSA, some to Miscellaneous. And there is nobody that has the authority to create that platform that combines them all, to track all spending in one place, to designate consistent identifiers that have to be used, whether you are an agency reporting a payment to a contractor, or you're a contractor reporting that you're spending the money, or you're a prime contractor reporting that you handed it out to a sub. There's no one that's got the authority to say that the same identifier, maybe the LEI, maybe the LEI, the same identifier has to be used in all three of those cases. Fundamentally, that's why we need legislation and why, as the Comptroller General of the United States testified last July, without legislation, it won't happen. And you mentioned, so the uniform award identifier was something that the recovery board put a white paper out on, and then the gap board put in their recommendation. Mm -hmm. And I'll give, so right now, each program has their own way of making award numbers. 
And um, one of the things we learned in recovery was there were also, so, so the program would create an award identifier. And then the agency might create another one. And the financial part of that agency might create a third one and possibly even the reporting entity. So recipients would literally get a piece of paper with a bunch of award IDs. So how did we discover that? We discovered that because we made recipients had to report. I mean, we didn't make them, they had to. And these numbers didn't, and then we told OMB, we need a list from the agencies to say who you gave money to, which took nine months for them to tell us who they gave money to. Okay, it's recovery funds. They finally did. And we tried to match those lists. Guess what? The numbers weren't the same. And yes, there's fat fingering and stuff like that. But we found out it was because you're like, okay, what of these four numbers is my award identifier? We also learned there was a dis problem with that because universities were saying, it's, we're really having a hard time doing your recovery reporting. So we went out there. We didn't just say too bad. We went out and said, talk to me. We were trying to figure out why it was difficult. And there's a lot of what the government calls pass-through money. So an award might be given to one group, especially a scientific award, to one group, and they may go decide that UCLA across the country will actually be doing the work. So it's, we call it pass-through. Well, so we just gave that first prime four different numbers to try to decide on. They've got to put that in their system so they can collect money, and then they're going to pass that money on, and God knows what that number looks like at the end. And by the way, within the federal government, some of the agency numbers are so long that by the time it gets to the Treasury to pay, the Treasury truncates them. So we as oversight people, we're trying to find which awards they really were. Um, so that's why we need a law. Um, and I think, so the first effort that came out of um, OMB, which was um, before the recent efforts, which have been stronger, I have to say, recently, yeah. I think the executive branch is, is really trying to work to do more through the Treasury. Um, they just said, we're going to ask each agency to have their own uniform award numbering system. But still doesn't solve the problem across the board. So I think this is why it comes to a law, because the higher up you can make a, a mandate, the more strict you could be. You're not dealing with, you know, with these, the, mm -hmm. the daily type of somebody coming to your door and saying, but it's going to be hard for me. So It certainly sounds like an enforcement issue, I, and that there I just is. isn't a body that can wield a big enough stick to the other agencies right. to kind of pull all yeah. this together. Um, one of the things that I, I, I love that the recovery board does is there's a significant degree of public engagement. Um, so there is a blog, there's, there's social media outreach, there's, um, like you said, you're going out to the actual recipients and talking to them and looking what their problems are. And I think for a lot of people, USA Spending is just a website. Um, nobody really has ownership over it. Uh, so I think, I don't know if this is specifically addressed in the Data Act, but what are some lessons maybe learned from recovery or elsewhere about engaging the public on this type of data that we can use going forward? Um, we definitely found we needed to work with the people who were receiving the money. That um, too often we just, the federal government puts money out there and, and hopes it gets out there. Um, some real positives came. So um, I, like I said, from the beginning, Earl put me in charge of working with all the governors. The president did a very smart thing. He brought in the governors and made them each sign something that said, you have to watch recovery money. And one thing I liked about the Recovery Act, it goes back to having a law, there was clawback in it. Meaning, if the monies weren't properly executed, on the, the federal government could take them back. And I know of states that that first year put aside some general fund money just out of fear because they were learning how to execute this centrally and not that they thought were purposely going to do anything, but out of fear that it might go wrong. They woke up. So the president said to the governors, I'm holding you accountable, and the vice president stayed on the phone with them. And then we did, you know, we worked with all of them. So one thing that was learned out of the Recovery Act was, um, you know, governors are elected on a platform. 
people want them to do something. Well, they discovered that they didn't know what all federal funds were coming in and that their agencies were kind of willy-nilly like, oh, I like frogs. There's some frog money. I'm going to get, I'm going to get me a grant. And that, so they'd win a grant. And maybe frogs wasn't what the people elected the governor on. It might have been education or women's rights or something. So there was all this money all over. And the other thing they were learning is grants often have matching funds. And I have talked to comptrollers, state comptrollers, who said people would come to their office and go, oh, by the way, I, I got a grant. They're like, great, thanks. We'll put it in the budget. Oh, but you have to match it. And I'm like, well, we didn't plan on it. So. And nobody was doing anything wrong. It's just in riper times, this was how it was done. So a real positive thing came because we worked hand in hand was a lot of governor's offices have set up small grants coordination offices. That helps us as feds because they are helping make sure that they're acted on and, and that money is spent quickly and properly. But it also helps the, the outcome of it. So I think... Um, that's the kind of thing that uh, that it'll help. Um, okay. And just the co coordination, talking with the users of your money, talking with the you realize you really do have partners out there. The state auditors and and oversight people are really trying. The stewards of our money mm -hmm. and um, working closely with them and just trying to see where is the language difference. And then we also owe it to them to. Um, be more concise. I mean, when we talk about standardizing data terms, um, it's not as hard as some people are making it out to be. Um, with modern things, usually you can derive certain points, so you, you don't need to collect all the points we have traditionally. You can derive a congressional district from an address. I mean, and that's just a very easy one, but there are a lot of other, there's a lot of other math that can go on where we're right now asking for any little element. Um, but when I talk about being fair to the recipients who are trying to give us this data, um, the definition of fuel is different throughout different agencies. Um, place of performance. In the Recovery Act, it was clear and it was in the law, and so we said the place of performance is where the work is being done. And that's not pure. If you're building a highway across a state, you're going to have to have a formula. So I'm, I'm not trying to say, oh, it's the end all be all. But the place of performance definition, I believe, in both FAFADA and, um, and um, safety, or not safety, the, the grants, or the contracting one, mm -hmm. can be three things. You can put where your national or international headquarters is. You can put the branch that got the contract or where the, the, the um, plant where the work is, the thing is being made. Or you could put where the work's being done. Good luck mapping that. Good luck showing where that project is so that somebody could follow up on it. Um, so I think that's a disservice, you know, to to the public and to. So when we talk about having to have data standards like the Data Act says, mm -hmm. a lot of it is a lot of is applying real logic and and not trying to make it hard for people. So. I just have one more question, and then we'll go on to audience questions. Um, so the LEI was derived from the need from financial markets, but um, one of the things, at least I come across a lot as an oversight um, nonprofit, is even just tracking entities within government that are part of government is really difficult. So I wonder, what are the things we need to do, or how far away are we from using something like the LEI to track government entities, nonprofit entities, all kinds of things, not just necessarily financial ones? I think, uh, well, first of all, the LEI really came up in the context of the financial crisis and as such has been designed to try and address data deficiencies in the world of finance. But I think conceptually, and if it is able to be implemented properly, and efficiently, it's going to provide a very good reference, a very good, a very good example of how this can be extended to other, uh, you know, agencies, government, civil society, NGOs, and so on. Because 
There's nothing really sinister or dramatic about LEI. It's data management. And we all know that, you know, financial data is relevant in different contexts, not only in the context of financial entities being able to manage their risk or regulators being able to manage or assess systemic risk, but it's also relevant and critical for other purposes and objectives to be achieved. If I take the example of public, but there are challenges. I mean, are the model, are the concept, it's definitely applicable. But the problem I think is, or the challenges would be from an implementation perspective. Because if we take the example of public or political funding, or campaign finance, as it is called, there are, it presents different issues. One example, one issue would be, you know, funding, or cash funding, or what kind of transaction would you wish to capture? Because contribution can take different form, not necessarily, you know, cash or, exactly. So that's one challenge. How are you able to define and capture you know, any form of contribution? Another challenge would be you know, getting the entities involved to report. How far and to what extent would those you know, PAC be, first of all, qualified or be required to register and report? their contribution. So there are, you know, numerous issues that have to be addressed. What I'm trying to say really is that conceptually it's a beautiful system to be used to achieve other uh, objectives, but from a point of implementation and operation, each, you know, kind of environment presents its own challenges and those challenges have to be addressed to make it implementable. Thank you. When yeah. I was an oversight committee staffer, I was curious about how many federal agencies there were. And I asked the Congressional Research Service, and I asked the Government Accountability Office, and I asked OMB, and I got a different answer from all three. That's because it's nobody's job in the federal government to track what federal entities there are, what agencies there are, and how they're subdivided, and what programs they have. So nobody does that work. Under the Data Act, there's a mandate at least for identifiers for agencies. We don't even have that. Uh, OMB uses one set of numbers and Treasury uses the other set of numbers. And there's a 90-page PDF document that tells you if you are a budget manager how to translate between the two of them. We don't even have that. Uh, under the Data Act, it becomes somebody's job at least to start that work, at least to start the very complicated work that Naveen is describing of figuring out if we're a federal government, what, who, who are we? What are our entities? How are they divided? And what programs are they running? Can I? Yeah, sure. Sorry. Yeah, uh, I think you raised a very important issue that had come up in the numerous discussion we've had so far about the LEI on the implementation dimension. The question of legislation or regulatory compulsion as opposed to a self, mm. you know, regulating system. And the debate is still on because it's related to the jurisdiction, for example, where it's going to be implemented, or it may be related to entities, types. I mean, it's interesting that in the US, and you know, that, that's a good sign, that the CFTC has a regulatory mandate. For example, I think a few weeks ago on the swap reporting obligation or now, you know, all those entities that are dealing with swap uh, transaction have an obligation to report and to get the LEI. So on the other hand, we have the argument that, you know, this should be a self-regulating system allowing participants to, you know, join in other than when. So I think, as you pointed out in a different context, you know, whether you're going to have regulatory compulsion and mandate as opposed to allowing, you know, self-reporting is, is a big, 
a very important issue. I mean, we all know that in the financial crisis, the argument was put forward that self-regulation may not may <laughs> present challenges, but... Well, it sounds yeah. like we've tried that about six times, maybe probably way more. Um, <laughs> yeah, and the, the question about enforcement is interesting. I mean, I feel like we keep coming back to accountability and enforcement because it's going to be a requirement for some of these financial <coughs> markets, for these entities to participate, they have to have it. So in that case, the, the enforcement is happening at the exchange level. Um, so I guess in a matter for the government, it would have to be legislation or some kind of regulatory thing. Um, but yeah, so if we have any questions from the audience, um, I would just ask that you wait till you get the microphone and then just say your name and, and what organization you're with. Let's start in the front. Hi, I'm Joe Marie Grease Grabber with New Rules for Global Finance and thrilled with the conversation. I wanted to ask about possible problems besides turf, I mean, between agencies. What about the security issues and the need or desire to hide information so that, I mean, obviously in the defense budget, but also in NSA and in um, CIA and all other forms of security, um, that will make other programs much more transparent to the bad guys, if you will, and, and have you thought about that? The other thing is on the private sector side, how much strength does uh, Dun and Bradstreet have as a lobbyist to prevent the success of this or comparable agencies such as Dun and Bradstreet that are making money off it, whether it's Reuters or Bloomberg or whatever, whoever else you, you mentioned? Maybe I'll take uh, opposition to the Data Act for $300. <laughs> I've, uh, I have never come across any opposition to the Data Act that's rooted in wanting to keep certain information hidden. And maybe that's just because there's already a provision in there that says we, this law will not compel the disclosure of information that's classified or that wouldn't be revealed in response to a FOIA request. I have come across opposition from the con in the contracting world uh, to having information that's already public become more searchable. They call it the mosaic effect. There are some contractors that believe that if you took all of these different reports that have to do with the one contractor's work from different agencies, and they're all, you could already get them, you could get them today if you knew where to look, but you made them all searchable together, maybe by tying them all together with a common identifier, then suddenly you know all of SAP North America's government business model. Uh, I've never seen the mosaic effect actually hurt anyone's business, but it's so theoretical it's hard to argue against. Uh, um, however, the, as much as the concerns have been raised by the contracting community, notably, notably Tech America, about the mosaic effect, they haven't actually asked for changes in the bill. So they've, they've said, we're worried about the mosaic effect and reviewing this and careful, careful, but haven't requested changes. So not significant, there hasn't been significant opposition as a result of wanting to keep information hidden or harder to find. Your second question about the lobbying strength of Dun & Bradstreet, uh, any of you lobby for Dun & Bradstreet? <laughs> I've never met them. I'd love to and, and talk through it, but I, I haven't known Dun & Bradstreet to oppose the Data Act or other proposals for consistent and non-proprietary data standards. I, was gonna say, I don't know anything about their lobbying. Thank you. I don't know anything about their lobbying. I think, and this is me speaking for myself, um, you have a company that essentially has a monopoly. And through that monopoly, we're held hostage. So I, I don't know about their lobbying, but I know you don't have much choice but to use them. So I'll put it that way and say I think it's, when, when you used hundreds of thousands, I laugh. It's hundreds of millions. I'm curious if I know if, what if, I spend. I know what my 40 person agency has to spend with them to display data on recovery.gov and to use in our ROC, in our Recovery Operations Center. Um, it's a monopoly, which I didn't think was allowed, but I guess I'm not. I guess I need to go back for a little more classes. On, on the question of chick can I? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, on the question of security, I think the distinction had to be kept in mind between security and privacy. 
what I understand, and forgive me if I misunderstood you, when I look at security in the context of designing data model, I'm looking at security as a technical issue whereby people can you know, access and tamper and, and you know, hack the system. So this is an issue which is different because this can exist as well. I mean, to try and make sure that the quality of data, because the critical issue about the LEI or any data system for that matter is quality, reliability, and accuracy. And so security in that context is an issue that had to be really thought through. And the LEI, as far as I know, is working on this to try and make sure that you know, the loopholes are plugged into that tampering and hacking and whatever are addressed. But confidentiality and privacy is a separate issue, which is really important in the question of the LEI or any transparency initiative because it raises fundamental issues of law and policy and jurisdiction. Because there are, last Friday I had a call, a relationship call, and you know, they did, one of the interveners just said that some financial entities make it their job to make money out of keeping information private. I think that's not nothing new about this. So I think privacy and confidentiality is a very important issue to try and make sure that the global LEI system is really implemented across the world. Because in some jurisdiction, privacy and confidentiality are a really critical issue. On political leverage, you know, dance and so on, I think the way to look at it is they are big data vendors. So when the LEI, the global LEI come into play, where do they find their data services? Where does it fit within the global LEI system? And, you know, as conglomerates or, you know, having sole proprietary, uh, you know, ownership on their data, I think those are the issues that we'll have to, to look into. Yeah. Security and privacy are always interesting because they're almost more social norms in like a particular jurisdiction than they are a universal yeah. definition. I mean, even a lot of states will make every state employee salary public and other states would never dream of doing that. So even within the U.S. you have really differing opinions on what privacy and security mean. Um, so let's go over here. Oh, just wait for the mic. Comment and then a question picking up on the privacy and trade. Could you introduce yourself? Jim Snyder from ISOL, and uh, it's, it's a big problem. Um, public employee unions, for example, are very powerful. Uh, yeah, and they are adamantly opposed to line item disclosure of compensation information. It's a little bit less of a problem for federal budgets because the employee line items is blocked and subcontracted out. But when you get to local government, you're talking 80, 90%. And that's untouchable in most districts. I mean, that's a third rail. No politician is really going to allow that. And also, common identifiers is just an, an absolute nightmare. If you're too optimistic on your trades, you're, you have a, a mosaic effect. I think there's a more hidden opposition there. It just hasn't been mobilized. They haven't asked for change in the bill. Yeah, okay. Well, that just raises my question. I think you're far too optimistic about the power of legislation to get things done. There is a huge difference between passing a bill and actually getting something to happen. And I would have uh, more confidence um, in this analysis if you were aware of other lessons where there were similar efforts for interoperable data. And I'm thinking in particular of the health interoperable expenditure. I think it was $2 billion in the stimulus fund out of the, the trillion to have uh, health, health interoperable data, which is quite different from the health exchange uh, vision. And they've hired hundreds of employees and it's been years and as far as I'm I understand that's been basically a total waste it, nothing has come out of it and despite millions of articles on the IT failures with the health exchange and I haven't seen a single item on this because it doesn't directly relate to people in the same way maybe they don't understand it and it, I, I find that amazing and I don't think the open government community is aware and it's a larger issue in my opinion with the open government community because I believe the payoff is you know, if you get funders to pass the bill, the Data Act is great, that's a headline, you get money, you get pension, and whatnot, but really making something work, which is a whole level of, 
a different understanding and being aware of all these political and technical obstacles, <laughs> it just doesn't seem to happen in our system and it's why you can have something like this healthcare best with you know very prominent Harvard professors involved and whatnot writing these things. They just couldn't figure out what you really needed to get done. They got the legislation, a centralized entity, but it just didn't happen because somebody really didn't think it through. And I think there's a lot more of that here that has been led on in this discussion and just because you're so focused on getting the bill passed, really thinking it through the wrong if I could summarize, so responding to being over-optimistic about legislation and the power of that to do, and other lessons learned from previous efforts on data standardization and interoperability. None of the companies that have joined the Data Transparency Coalition and pay to be members are going to be satisfied unless there are government-wide data standards, unless there are things that they can do to republish or to analyze or to automate those reports. That's why they're in it, and that's why we really see passing the bill as the first step. After that it comes the hard part. We've got to put pressure on Treasury to set the right standards, maybe by using the LEI. We've got to put pressure on the agencies to actually take those standards and use them in those eight different reporting streams that I mentioned. And we have to put pressure on Congress, including some of the folks in this room, to continue the oversight. So often Congress passes management-related mandates, like the Government Performance and Results Act in 1993, the Government Performance and Results Act Modernization Act in 2010, FIFADA itself in 2006, the CIO Act, the CFO Act, the Federal Financial Managers Integrity Act, the uh, federal funding, um, the Federal Financial Assistance Management Improvement Act of 99. So often, management mandates are passed and then Congress forgets about them. The reason why this organization exists is to make sure that if the Data Act passes, Congress doesn't. Fast on the second question that you asked about uh, about precedent, uh, take a look at Brazil. Why doesn't why, why doesn't healthcare interoperability work? Well, it's a it, It's a well, healthcare is a, a really complicated industry, and I'm sure they're lobbying for it to work as well. Uh, but we work with what we're given. Uh, as to your question about uh, about precedent for putting data standards into government spending, take a look at Brazil. They have a single data format that uh, that combines the general ledger transactions and financial reporting. Take a look at Slovenia, where they publish every single payment. Take a look at New York City, where every government transaction is published and it aggregates up to the account level. Iowa does the same thing. Texas does the same thing. This is being done elsewhere. Our federal government is behind the curve. Do you want to respond quickly and then we'll take one more question? Yeah, I'll just say, I mean, I don't think anyone's up here saying, oh, the law, it's going to work, it's going to happen. We had Fafada, it didn't completely get, but we have to work with what we have. And there are a lot of good people trying, but the power of a law that tries to push Fafada one more step, mm -hmm. that tries to pull some of this together, is not a bad thing. It won't happen. It's not a magic wand, but it can help push people, and it can. So I, 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 nobody's up here saying, oh, whoop, that's it, I go home. But I know that four and a half years ago, I walked into nothing except a law telling us what to do. <clears throat> okay? There were three of us for the first month on the board. Then there were 13. We built two, some things that really freaking work. <laughs> That's a quote, but they do. So I've been a part of a small one. So I think why I get excited when I see, you know, Mrs. Pelosi and Mr. Bain are voting for the same bill is I have a hope that some of those good government things will get translated out there. So it, it's not a naive, it, it's- It's kind of naive. <laughs> well, even, even if something doesn't get passed, I think just the existence of the Draft Data Act is it's probably important. prompted the Government Accountability and Transparency Board to be created. I mean, it puts pressure on the administration, even if That is actually why it was created. <laughs> um, okay, one hour. more question. Is it Daniel? Which Daniel? This one over here. Uh, so, actually, just a quick comment and uh, a question. Uh, the question first, which is actually getting to what we were just talking about. Uh, 
you know, at, from some of what I've looked at, the Recovery Accountability Transparency Board has been significantly more efficient than other entities that have existed along the same lines in terms of reducing waste, fraud, and abuse. I was hoping you could talk about that a little bit more. What, what was done that was differently, and can you sort of quantify? Um, uh, you know, I'd seen reports that, that it was keeping these kinds of problems under 1% in terms of money spent, you know, what is that? What is the actual number, and sort of how do you how did you figure that out? Uh, I also wanted just to, for the mosaic effect, uh, since that was something that came up before, and it's this terrible term that's that's mm. sort of uh, stolen over. Byzantine. Well, it's, it's stolen over from the national security realm, where it's also used in ways which is sort of nefarious. Uh, but in this context, there are already corporations whose job it is to engage in this type of sleuthing. So you know. The rest of us may not have access to how much money was it SAP that uses as an example that, that that different folks spend. I use that because SAP raised the objection. Oh, well, in that case, so but you know I'm sure SAP or others like it spend a lot of time analyzing market segment. They they're going they're already gathering the contracting data. They're already flowing for it. They already had this information. What we're not what we're talking about is not no access for anyone versus versus access for all. What we are instead talking about is access for a few wealthy folks or corporations that can afford to do this type of data analytics versus access to this information for all of us so they're all on, on an equal playing field. So it, it's not um, you know, keeping things secret, it's more do a couple people have a competitive advantage based on the ability to pay for information or is it do we all have access to the same types of information so that we can then compete on a, on a level playing field. And I'll, I'll get off the soapbox so that we can <laughs> hear about the, the what recovery lessons. Sure. So really quickly, we were young and small, so that was one <laughs> advantage. And we were told what we had to accomplish, but not how. So I think that was very important. So um, we had four months to build this thing. So you know what we did is we were taking the best and brightest IT people on six-week details. Because Earl, our chairman, knew to get the best, if we asked for a year or two or three, you think you're, that agency head's gonna give it to us? No. We also used the newest technology. And um, I, Evan Burfield wrote a very good piece in the Post about what's wrong with government contracting and IT. And he had the figures, and you probably know them. Um, the federal government spends exponentially more on IT than it did 20 years ago. And, and I'm not gonna make up numbers because I don't know what they were. Yet the cost of using IT and building systems has come down substantially. And the example that was used is that we did not have to use the big guys. We didn't, I mean, we followed contracting rules, but we weren't under the same. So we were able to use people who knew how to deal with startups, use the newest technology. Federal reporting, we put in the cloud. We have a ton of security measures around it. We, we were just able to do those things. No one stopped us, and we were nimble. So I think that's one reason. Um, working with the people, working with the agencies, the states, the, the municipalities, the NGOs, we worked with the people who had to use these systems, and we listened to them. We didn't always do what they said, but we did listen and we tried to accommodate. So I think that was one, that's a reason that we were. Um, as far as substantiating the savings, it's difficult because you wait for investigations to come through, but the number of open cases is much smaller. And I think it's a combination of a lot of things. We, because of reporting, were able to look at awards and spending. Federalreporting.gov, every quarter, they had to report what percent they were done with their, their work. They also had to report what they'd taken in on the grant or contract. So you could do simple analogies to see where there might be a problem. Um, and the, because we were able to get it out there and, and have that data there for every level, rich, poor, a, a major data miner person, or somebody who says, I care about education, and oh my god, there's supposed to be a school being back, built in my backyard, and it's not, or it is, or whatever. Um, the light was shining on it, and the reality of it is, people are going to be think twice about stealing that money if it's easy to see. So, I mean, we have to throw that in. We can't give ourselves just credit for being great sleuths. Um, and before you go into the mosaic thing, I think one group that we've been dealing with is um, nonprofits. 
Nonprofits do a significant amount of work in this country. They, they really help extend and take care of citizens. And they want more transparency because they struggle to see the network of nonprofits that is doing really important work that citizens depend on. And a lot of that is supported through grants or in order to increase their fundraising, they may need to show, look, the government believes, you know, they're just trying to look at funds and see where it should come from. And so they actually, that's a group that doesn't have a lot of money who, um, you know, it, it, they're, they're not corporations. They're trying to band together and they are desperately asking for this so that they have equal access to it. So I, I think it's both sides of the spectrum. All right, thank you. Are you gonna respond? No, okay, great. Um, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, and I wanna thank all of our panelists, Hudson, Nancy, and Naveen for being here. If you want to keep up to date on future act events, you can go to transparencycaucus.org. And thank you again, everyone for coming. <laughs>